We are the group of the future, and we did our project on the American Public Education System K through 12. Management 4750, Fall 2011. Professor Ken Morrell. The group of the future members are Thomas Anderson, James Taylor, Angelina DeLillo, and Aaron Carthen. Our particular focus um, as a group of professional consultants, we've been hired to conduct an environmental scan and conduct a clear forecast of the next 10 to 20 years of America's K-12 public education sector. As a team, we will set specific goals that should be set for our industry in this future time period, as well as what should be done for our industry to meet these goals in the future. The, the following environmental scan sections have been broken down into the following format. Sociocultural changes, Thomas Anderson. Economic changes, James Taylor. Political legal changes, Aaron Carthan. Technological changes will be done as a team effort, and educational changes will be performed by Angelina DeLillo. The current status of America's K-12 public education sector is in a crisis stage compared to other countries worldwide. The public education system is currently designed on a very dated K-12 system, which is based on age. Each grade takes a student one academic year to complete. Lightly said, the country's public education sector is, in, is currently eroding since it is designed like a factory that never stops producing, regardless of the product's many defects. Each year students are pushed through the grades the same regardless of the individual strengths or weaknesses that a student can develop in their school's curriculum along the production line. In each grade, the students build their knowledge of core curriculum in fields such as math, science, history, grammar, and art, to name a few. At the end of each year, students are required to take standardized tests issued nationally, locally, or by the school state. These tests are designed to measure how well each student is progressing their knowledge in the school's core subjects. If students do well, they are able to proceed on to the next grade. If for some reason a student does not do well on the test, they can be held back for another year in the current grade. This is done to try and improve a student's weaknesses. Unfortunately, this process has become worse each year due to bad teachers, bad home lives, for students and poor schools to name a few of the many problems. Currently students are not able to build on their individual strengths. Instead students are supposed to be efficient in all fields. Why should this work? Does this mean that all adults should be proficient in all career fields? The system simply does not work currently and is in need of a major reform in the near future. Here are a few charts just to show how the U.S. compares to other countries worldwide. As you can see the U.S. used to be at the top of these lists, and now we continue to slope towards the bottom. Okay, the market. Teachers um, expect schools want the best and the most qualified educators to work for them. Parents, um, parents want their children to have the best education school experience that, the, that will best prepare them for college life. Students. School wants to uh, attract the best and the most determined student to help the school succeed. Government. They provide grants and funding for school systems as well as create policies for minimum learning standards. Community. Schools need to support the local community to better help their school system. A summary of the history of the American public school industry K-12 through um, start, will start that they differ, America's public education differs from that of many other nations because it's the primarily the responsibility of the states and the individual school districts. The first publicly supported secondary school in the United States was the Boston Latin School founded in 1635. Individual states rather than the federal government have primary authority over public education in the United States. In the past, public schools have relied heavily on local property taxes to meet the vast majority of school expenses. American schools uh, have thus tended to reflect the educational values and financial capabilities of the communities in which they are located. The federal commitment to improve and finance public schools expanded enormously when Congress passed the National Defense Education Act of 1958 and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. 
In these two landmark statutes, Congress addressed for the first time such broad problems as expanding educational opportunity for poor children and improving instruction in pivotal but usually neglected subjects such as science, mathematics, and foreign languages. Discrimination in schools on the basis of race and gender has always persisted. Girls at one time were not admitted into schools until many years after the establishment of the schools, and even then, they were not taught the same subjects as boys. During the 1950s, segregation by race in public and private schools was still common in the United States. The South had separate schools for African Americans and whites, and, this, and the system had been upheld by the Supreme Court until, um, until Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Um, segregation usually resulted in inferior education for black students, and average public expenditures for white schools exceeded expenditures for black schools. Therefore, teachers in white schools generally received higher pay than did teachers in black schools. And facilities in most white schools were far superior to the facilities in most black schools. The growth and development. The American K-12 public education system has come a long way since its humble beginnings as small one-room buildings in rural settings across America. Since the turn of the 21st century, the American school is a much different place. Large national systems of education govern schools. Teachers must have specialized training and a college degree and are a more diverse group. Students are separated by grades. Classrooms are filled with books, maps, and electronic equipment. Telecommunications empower students to cull information from around the world directly into their classrooms. Students can participate in classes led by teachers in other states. In some communities, children attend school year-round, including summer. Schools are larger with expanded sports and extracurricular, at pro extracurricular programs. The power of community and the high value placed on education are more evident in the shared efforts involved in maintaining the schools. Here are some photos of the past and the present classroom. Hi, I'm Thomas Anderson, and my portion of this project is done on the sociocultural changes. Start out, what are sociocultural changes? Sociocultural change is an umbrella term for theories of cultural evolution and social evolution describing how cultures and societies have changed over time. The past, what we have learned in the past, are the critical components of predicting the future. Social cultural change. The future is a dilemma, not a problem. The key difference is a problem can be solved. A dilemma cannot. All we can do as a society is try to take the necessary steps that we feel will better prepare us to deal with this dilemma. As, every, as everyone should know, every person has a different view on, on, their, on their way of looking at things. You know, no opinion's wrong or right, it's just that everybody has a different view. And in education, we're having to pick apart all these different views and have the people in political power decide which views we should take. Currently there are over 10,000 separate democracies in America's school systems. What this means is, is that all 10,000 of these systems are working independently from one another. Instead of collaborating and team building with each other, they're just going at things their own way. What is being accomplished here? Nothing. They're working against each other. Each of these systems could build upon each other's knowledge and just simply there prepare our children for a better education now and in the future. Another thing I'd like to talk about is children's opinions matter. Even if they're in high school, elementary school, it shouldn't matter. If they feel that they're not getting an adequate education for what they want to do, they should be heard. It's their right to be heard just like any other person. As a school system, we have to expand on what students are good at. Right now, as we stated earlier, it's just a production, production system. If I'm good at math, I have to be good at everything. Why can't I perform better at math and put more of my time into working at math? That way, if that is going to be my future career, I'm better prepared. We need to more focus on curriculum. Right now, we have so many other aspects of high school, which are all fun, but what is the point of school? Is it to learn or is it to have a good time with your friends? 
these are just a few of the things that I see moving into the future. I'm now going to talk about the values. I see in the near future we'll be working towards more of a supportive culture for institutional change. People are getting tired of the way things are in education right now. Yes, they worked many years ago, but we live in such a technolog technologically advanced world now that the production line system of education just is not working anymore. We have to build upon what students are good at. Parents will need to exercise more control on school decisions. They can do this by attending board meetings, uh, PTA meetings, anything to get involved and help better prepare their children. In our society now, empowerment means a lot. Everybody wants to know we're being heard, and that has a lot to do with the children, too. Next, I will talk about personal beliefs in the future. More and more as a society, we progress towards an entitlement theory. We feel that just because we're born, we're, we're owed something. Our country or our peers, they owe us something just for us being humans. And we're not going to sit here and argue whether this is right or wrong, but this can lead you know, to problems as far as children go into college later on in the years, what schools they go to. Everybody just wants to be the same, and that's why you're going to see more more of a move towards equality in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Accountability. Accountability is another big factor. As I had stated earlier, people are tired of people getting away with things and not being held accountable. Our schools are failing. Why are politicians, uh, administrators, teachers, why are they not being held accountable? And we're going to see a progression towards these people being held accountable. If they're not doing their job, they will be removed because it's better for society. We're also, a lot of people want to see more of performance-based testing. You know, how, how are these teachers succeeding? It, they're saying they're doing better, but are they really doing better? And that's a lot of what we'll see moving into the future as far as people's beliefs. I'm now going to talk a little bit about the demographics. The America has grown substantially over the past 100 years, but in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see that expansion slow down. We're not reproducing as much as we used to be or as much as other countries around the world are. We have a lot of older workers still in our career system. Uh, the life expectancy race is growing. Uh, you're going to see up to five generations in the workforce at one time. And you're also going to see more of a global system, collaboration across the borders. People are going to look to people in other countries, regardless of different nationalities, and we're all going to work together to solve all sorts of things, from education to careers to politics to economies. You see it now, and it's going to continue in the future. There's also going to be very diverse student groups, and those are going to have to be equally treated for the educational system to work correctly. I'm now going to talk about a little bit of the lifestyle of the population. We become more and more influenced by technology. It's a part of every aspect of our life almost, from iPhones to computers, we use it for everything. And you're going to see this progress in education as well. Uh, we're very overstimulated. As individuals, we're trying to do a million things at once, it seems. We can't just focus on one problem, and our students are doing the same thing. They're, you know, they're learning how to work computers in a very young grade, and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I feel like there's going to be a little bit of a de decrease in competition among individuals. We're more worried about society as a whole. We're not worried about ourselves. I mean, this is going to take many years to change, but this might be how our youth are being taught in schools in the future. We're also going to have a, a much better lifestyle than people before us. Technology has amassed so many things that our parents or our grandparents couldn't have. Can you imagine what our children will have in the future? I also feel that eco-friendly is going to become a way of life. Everybody, classrooms are going to be more eco-friendly, less paper, things are going to be virtually done and it's all going to support an eco-life. Eco 
that summarizes all the sociocultural changes we predict in the future. Now I'm going to hand off to James, who's going to talk about the economic changes for the future of education. Hello, my name is James Taylor. I'm going to talk to you about the economic effect of the public school system. And these are just some graphs that I pulled up just to give you a little information to show you that the price of public school education is going up every year. In the last five to ten years, it's almost doubled the cost. It went from 5000 to 11000 per student just in that quick of a time. But the only problem is that our scores aren't going up. We're not even competing close to other countries. The United States is way behind in math and science. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the cost associated like to pay for each student. The graphs already showed you a little bit of the information on it, but as I said, the cost is going up a lot and the students are not increasing their capacity to learn. So obviously spending money isn't the key. We need in the future need to find ways to allocate our resources so that people get the education they deserve without wasting a whole lot of money. And the next part I'd like to talk about is the costs that are going to be associated with students now like what we're going to have to pay. There's going to be budget cuts with every part of every school in the system until this recession comes out. Students are going to have to be cut from even public schools. They're going to be cut transportation like a bus. Uh, kids are going to have to find ways to get to school, and that's going to be a great burden on their families. They're doing something like the four-day school week is going to become very possible. And families are going to have to find daycare for the fifth day for those young students, and that's going to put a major strain on the families. And then we're going to lose very valuable programs like dropout and summer school. I mean, these dropout programs could be just cost tremendous amounts. But think how much it could save. How much money could a student make for this country if they don't drop out of high school and then one day become a graduate student and own their own business? How important could that be? How could the little bit of the dropout program? I believe it evens out because, and it's going to cut out field trips. People aren't going to enjoy going to school anymore. They're not going to be able to make up grades in summer school. And it's just, the costs are going to be tremendous. And I believe it's going to hurt the country not spending that money to help the school system. Next part I'd like to talk about is teachers are also going to lose. Teachers, there's a 3% salary decrease in effect for teachers right now. They're also going to lose benefits. And what that's going to do is going to cause capable Capable suitors are not going to want to be teachers anymore. They're going to change their profession. I mean, I wouldn't really want to be a teacher if you told me going into it and in the next few years I'm going to lose money, I'm going to lose benefits, and you're also going to rate me a lot harder on the way students are performing. It's just it's not a good situation for teachers right now. It's not a good situation for the students or anything. I believe we need to find a way to allocate all of our resources and make a good mix so that we get the education we need and the United States doesn't fall behind other countries. All right. And the next thing I like to talk about is the way it's funded. The federal government actually gives the money to the states, but then the states separate it out into different districts. The only problem with this is each district is not separated equally. It seems like the more wealthier districts are getting more money, and the poor districts aren't getting as much. And it seems, needs to be the other way around, in my opinion. The poor ones are struggling on their tests, therefore they cut their funding. But the people that are doing good on their tests don't need the extra funding. It's the ones that are struggling we need to really help and save, save this country because is if we can bring up our worst our worst performers to a higher level, that's just going to create much more money and maybe help this economy one day. This is just what we need to do in the future. So the educational programs need to be assessed in worth, not money. If a program isn't working, it needs to be cut out. Some people say that small classrooms need to be cut out because it really doesn't make a difference. And if we could pay half as much and teach twice as many students, I believe that's something we need to do. And we need to reward teachers for improving students. And I believe that there's a lot of ways around it, so it needs to be on a standardized test method because teachers could just give out grades to help, to help get their rewards incentives. But we need to definitely tie in rewards to how teachers teach their students. We also need to adapt as organization. Like, teachers shouldn't be able to get tenure as easily. If a teacher's not performing, they should be able to lose their job much easier. And we ought to rate them on what they're doing, maybe on a, on a scale, maybe they should have to sign a new contract every couple of years just to ensure that teachers don't get lazy and stop teaching because that's the last thing our country needs. That pretty much summarizes all the economic impacts for the future and now I'm going to hand it off to Aaron with the political legal section of our project.
I'm going to talk about the political and legal changes that need to happen in the future to help our education system. All right. First, uh, I'm going to talk about No Child Left Behind. Uh, it was established in 2002, and what the system does is it, is it sets standards high to, for students so that they can uh, improve individually uh, based on their outcomes on uh, tests. Uh, and the requirements for standards that are being set are set by the states themselves, not by the uh, federal government. The problem with No Child Left Behind is, is that we set, uh, we give the individual states too, too much power. Uh, standards need to be set federally so that all of our children all around the world or all around the United States uh, learn the same amount of material. Uh, we also teach stu students in the same way that we teach every other student. Different students learn different things uh, in different ways. Some people learn by looking, some people learn by reading, and other people learn by doing. We can't just standardize how we teach our children. And lastly, we use standardized tests. Uh, we use standardized tests to measure uh, children, but some children might show their, their knowledge by, in different ways. Okay, to implement these type of change in the future, what we need to do is people need to, to go to their legislature and, and put pressure on them to make changes legally so that we can all benefit from the education changes uh, in, a, in a legal manner. Uh, political parties are right now are at war. They're, uh, they're going against each other and that's not what needs to happen. We need to be united in our front to, to change education and, and better things for our children. We can't rely solely on being a Democrat, Democrat or being a Republican. We need to unite uh, and be a bipartisan party to, to create education reform. Uh, learning stand standards on a national level. We need to, to teach our children uh, all around the United States in the same manner that, uh, uh, that an individual state would do. We need to set standards high on a federal level. Um, we also need to uh, look at best practices in uh, international uh, communities just because we, we want to we wanna have the best education system. We want to pit our children against the children somewhere else that are learning in different ways. All right, that covers pretty much the political and legal changes that need to happen in the future. I'm going to hand you off to Angelina who's going to tell you about the uh, educational changes that need to happen. My name is Angelina Delillo and I'm going to speak to you about the educational changes in the American public school industry K-12. through I'm going to go through the educational changes of teachers, students, administration, as well as family. Today's teachers go through school, they get a four-year degree, and after that they spend, a couple, they spend some time in schools doing student teaching hours, and then they're put into classrooms. But in the students who are going to be um, populating our workforce in the future, that's not enough time to, uh, to really learn and experience what they need to be teaching these students. I suggest going to school longer, getting a master's degree, and during this time, being um, an active person in the school system and not just one district, going to all different kinds of districts, all different neighborhoods, um, inner city suburbs, and teaching these students um, at different grade levels. Like one day you'll be teaching kindergarten students, the next day maybe middle school students. This way you're able to experience education and training on all different levels. One thing I recommend is better pay for teachers um, with this, with a better salary, teachers are more willing to invest time and money into their education as well as their training. Um, as we've learned before, merit pay is good, bonuses are good for that time being, but in the long run, it doesn't do, it doesn't make any sort of difference or change much as far as test scores go for students. Um, 
teachers, new teachers coming into the field should be partnered up with mentors, experienced teachers who have been in the field for a while. This way, they're able to learn from these professionals and the professionals are also able to learn from the new teachers in ways of new trends in education and new ways of learning. So throughout their profession, everybody is teaching everybody. And even after being hired, I feel that teachers should still partner up with teachers from all different districts and all different school systems and grades to keep learning and to be more creative and innovative in their career. The education of students in today's environment is more like a factory. The students are all in class by grade and by age, and that is how they are put through school. Um, subjects are completely separated from each other, even though sometimes these subjects may overlap. In the future, I recommend students be placed in the classrooms based on how they learn. Like a group of students ages maybe four to seven. They should be in a classroom. Um, perhaps they learn better in the morning, this group of students. So you will put them in a classroom in the morning learning more complex subjects such as math and science. And in the evening, where they're not as attentive, maybe you know put them with subjects that are more simpler to them and um, at the same time these students will be working in groups not just individuals sitting at desks staring up at the board and at a teacher in front of the room they're able to work together and be collaborative because this is what the workforce is going to be like in the future this is how these students are going to learn in the future and it's better to get them started at an early age as far as administration goes, I'm going to focus more on the school principals and the fact that, like teachers, the principals don't have enough education and training. Um, there's such a shortage of these leaders that they kind of just get thrown into their jobs. But although they're certified, they're not always qualified to do these jobs because they're lacking the professional preparation to do these jobs adequately. Um, some things that principals can do to better their, um, their profession is uh, such things as field-based internships where they are actually out in the field um, uh, experiencing the problems and coming up with solutions and getting that first-hand experience. Um, Cohort groups as well as mentors is where these leaders all come together and they support each other and give each other advice and this helps them through the difficult times within their profession. Families are very important to education. Um, most learning done today is go or in the future is going to be uh, outside of the classroom. With technology the way it is, you can bring a classroom into your home. It's just the time that the family and the parents are going to take to um, invest in their children's education. Things that will motivate families will be better school systems that encourage families to sit down at night and go through homework and figure out what these students are learning and be able to you know, find the different technology to help these students progress within their education. Shadow education is also becoming very common, and all that is is just private tutoring, whereas um, not just tutoring within the classroom, but outside the classroom, and these people will come and they will sit down with students during vacations and during weekends and um, just any time students need the help. As a group, we will now talk about technology changes in the future. Hi, I'm Thomas Anderson again, and I'm going to talk, talk on behalf of the rest of our group on the subject of technological changes in the future of education. Technology is rapidly expanding every year. I mean, from computers to laptops to cell phones, everything's expanding, and so is classroom education. The classroom of the future will be completely different than the class our grandparents went through, or I went through, 
our kids two, three years from now went through. It'll be more of a virtual classroom. You don't have to necessarily go to school. It's just like how in some colleges now you can take e-learning classes. The same thing will become relevant in childhood education. Students can learn from home. Uh, in education, why should bad teachers teach some students and other teachers, great teachers, teach other students? It's unfair. So why not let the best teachers teach everyone? We can do this through online videos, uh, virtual classrooms, as I stated earlier, and many other options for getting these voices heard from the best teachers. There will also be home computer learning systems, uh, you can even, you know, learn on game consoles that children play video games on currently. They could actually learn on that in the future. Um, there's several academies that are at the cutting edge of this currently, and I see more of this in the future. The uh, Khan Academy, for instance, is bringing homework to the classroom and learning lessons at home. They're actually doing the work in the classroom and watching the lessons at home. This makes more sense. Why not let the teacher, while he's in the classroom, be helping with the problems and the students, while they're at home, learning the actual curriculum? There's also interactive learning boards, uh, which the teachers can just pull up different things with the touch of their hands and uh, control the classroom. We'll see a lot more of that in the future. And also, apps on cell phones. There'll be educational apps on cell phones. People can uh, con contact their teachers through their cell phones and do learning by apps like that. All the advances are very critical because they allow students to spend more time on their classroom studies. And this is critical in the future of how well our students do compared to other countries. And that basically summarizes the technological changes we see in the future of education. It's time for change. Today's newborn will become college freshmen in the year 2030. It is time to reform our educational system to allow these individuals to prosper throughout their educations and life. Our final recommendations for a better, the better future of America's K-12 public education center system are the following. Promotion of school choice. We have the choice where we want to eat at night. It's imperative that children should have the choice of what school they go to. They can choose better schools. If the school they're currently going to is not working, it'll make sense for them to go to other schools. Introduce competition among schools. That is also critical because if one school is better than the other, then more students will flock to that school and therefore it'll weed out schools that aren't performing, which is critical. Next, we will need to introduce school vouchers in more areas. The voucher system basically puts the money on the student's head, not the school. Students can choose whichever school they want to go to, and they pay the school. So therefore, if the school is not performing, the student withdraws from the school, and the school loses money, and that allows the student to go to a better school. Testing should be on a more broad range of topics. This should allow individuals to not just go off math science. It should allow them to go off things that they're creative at, that they can expand their boundaries in, which will improve their future. Next, we say improve teachers. Teachers need to go through more training. They need to be training their whole career. Teachers can't just be happy they have the job and stop worrying about their students. They need to always be progressing and learning the newest things that will apply to the future of their children that they are teaching. Teachers need to be re rewarded. Teachers that are better establishing an education for students in the future need to be rewarded. Why are they being paid the same as a, a very bad teacher who's not preparing his students? It should be on a reward-based system just like any other company that people could work for. The last two are let children build on what they are best at. Everybody's good at something. You just have to find that niche. Education shouldn't just be based on a core curriculum of what some person in a big office thinks that children should learn. 
Children should be able to learn and expand on what they are good at because what you are good at is what's going to provide a living and help make a better future for America. And finally, we need to improve collaboration and teamwork at an earlier stage. Like Angelina said during her presentation, from college to careers, everything in the future will involve collaboration and teamwork, and students from an early age should learn about this to better prepare themselves for the future. This basically summarizes our recommendations for the better future of America's public education K-12 section.